For centuries, we looked up and assumed we understood our place. The stars seemed fixed, familiar. The Milky Way, just a pale band across the sky. But it wasn't obvious where we were within it, or even what it truly was. We couldn't see its shape, its center, or its edges. We were trying to map a structure from the inside, and yet, somehow, scientists did it. They figured out where our solar system sits inside the Milky Way, without ever stepping outside it. This isn't a story of direct observation. It's a story of inference, of building cosmic rulers, of decoding star clusters, pulses of light, and radio waves that pass through darkness. Bit by bit, we stopped assuming and started measuring. This is how we found our place, not by seeing the galaxy, but by learning to read the shadows within it. The first attempt to map our position in the Milky Way was limited, limited by the tools of the time, by assumptions about light, and by the illusion that the sky gave us a complete view. In 1785, British astronomer William Herschel began counting stars across the night sky, aiming his telescope in dozens of directions. He believed that more stars in a given direction meant greater depth into the galaxy. Fewer stars suggested you were near the edge. With this logic, he sketched a cross-section of the Milky Way, an elongated disk with the sun almost perfectly at the center. It looked symmetrical, it looked right, but it wasn't. Herschel didn't yet know that space is filled with clouds of interstellar dust, fine particles that absorb and scatter visible light. These clouds distort the apparent shape of the galaxy. What looks like the edge might simply be where your vision fails. In reality, much of the Milky Way was hidden, cloaked behind a veil of darkness Herschel couldn't pierce. This model persisted for decades, until a quiet revolution began in the early 20th century. The key didn't come from a larger telescope, but from a sharper pattern, discovered by Henrietta Swan Leavitt at the Harvard College Observatory. Studying Cepheid variable stars, she noticed that their brightness followed a rule. The longer the pulsation cycle, the brighter the star truly was. This discovery transformed these stars into tools. If you measured a Cepheid's pulse, you could determine its true luminosity. And comparing that to how bright it appeared from Earth, you could calculate its distance. Levitt's law gave astronomers something they never had before, a way to measure depth in space, not just direction. Suddenly, the sky changed. Regions that once seemed sparse revealed depth. Dim stars weren't necessarily faint. They were far. The illusion of symmetry shattered. The sun, it turned out, wasn't in the middle of a modest galaxy. It was somewhere off-center, surrounded by uncertainty. But the galaxy's true center was still hidden. No matter how far the new rulers could reach, visible light could only go so far. The dust was too thick. The glow of the core remained sealed behind layers of darkness. Yet this was the turning point. Astronomers stopped assuming they could see the galaxy. They began to accept that some truths had to be calculated not observed, and that shift from counting what we saw to measuring what we couldn't moved us one step closer to finding where we truly are. Because in astronomy, brightness is not always truth. Sometimes it's just a mask for distance or silence. Once astronomers had a reliable ruler to measure distances, the universe began to shift around them, not literally, but perceptually. What had once seemed symmetrical, now tilted. The elegant balance of star counts and visual impressions gave way to something messier, but more honest. And in that honesty came a revelation. Our solar system isn't near the center of the Milky Way. In fact, it's nowhere close. The person who first made this clear was Harlow Shapley, working in the 1910s. He didn't look at individual stars. Instead, he focused on something bigger, globular clusters. These are dense, spherical groupings of hundreds of thousands of ancient stars orbiting the Milky Way in vast, sweeping halos. Because these clusters lie outside the plane of the galaxy's dust, they offered a clearer path for measurement. And crucially, they contained the same kind of variable stars Henrietta Leavitt had studied, making it possible to calculate their distances with surprising accuracy. Shapley mapped their distribution and noticed something unexpected. The globular clusters weren't arranged evenly around the sun. They clustered, literally, toward a point 
in the direction of the constellation Sagittarius. That pattern didn't just suggest something, it demanded it. The true center of the Milky Way had to lie there, hidden behind clouds of dust, far beyond the reach of visible light. The sun, contrary to centuries of belief, wasn't central at all. It was offset, remote, orbiting quietly near the edge of something far grander and more complex. This was a profound correction. Humanity had already endured the shock of discovering that the Earth wasn't the center of the solar system. Now, it had to accept something just as humbling. Our sun, too, was displaced. Not by accident, but by cosmic design. We were not central. We were peripheral. The galaxy didn't revolve around us. We were simply riding along one of its spiral arms, tucked into a quieter corner of a much larger system. But the center that Shapley inferred remained invisible. It was a point buried behind interstellar dust so dense that even the most powerful optical telescopes of the time couldn't pierce it. We knew where the center was. We just couldn't see it. And yet, that didn't stop the science. Because when you know how to read the sky, not just look at it, you can begin to uncover what lies behind the veil. What Shapley proved was more than a correction to Herschel's model. It was a shift in mindset, the idea that you could locate something not by seeing it, but by understanding how everything else moves around it, that orbital patterns and star distributions could draw invisible lines to something hidden. It was no longer about direct observation. It was about inference, about geometry, about trusting that the absence of light was still filled with meaning. And so, even without ever laying eyes on the galactic center, we found it by watching the paths of ancient clusters by letting their gravity point the way. Because sometimes, the clearest picture of the universe doesn't come from light. It comes from the way matter arranges itself around what we cannot see. For decades, the center of our galaxy remained a ghost. We knew where it was, roughly. We had calculated its position from the way star clusters curved toward it, like rivers feeding an unseen ocean. But still, we couldn't see it. The core of the Milky Way lay buried behind thick clouds of gas and dust, dense enough to blot out entire constellations. And in the early 20th century, our telescopes were still blind to what lay behind that veil. Visible light was the problem. It scatters and fades when it hits interstellar dust, like a flashlight swallowed by fog. No matter how powerful the telescope, it couldn't penetrate the curtain. To truly see into the heart of the galaxy, astronomers had to find a new way to look, and that meant Turning to light, the human eye was never built to see. In the 1940s, a new kind of astronomy emerged, radio astronomy. Unlike visible light, radio waves can pass through dust clouds nearly unimpeded. At a wavelength of 21 centimeters, emitted by neutral hydrogen atoms, astronomers began to map the galaxy's structure, not by starlight, but by gas. And what they found was transformative, using radio data they traced the spiral arms of the Milky Way, discovered its rotation patterns, and confirmed that our solar system resided not near the center, but in a minor arm, now known as the Orion Arm, about 26,000 light years from the galactic core. But the radio signals held more than structure. They carried whispers from the center itself. In the 1970s, a powerful, compact radio source was detected right where Shapley's globular clusters had pointed decades earlier. It came from a region in Sagittarius, and it didn't behave like a star. The signal was dense, erratic, and intense. Eventually, it was given a name, Sagittarius A-star. Astronomers suspected it was something extraordinary, but it wasn't until the development of infrared telescopes capable of detecting heat and light far beyond the visible spectrum that they began to see what was hiding there. In the early 2000s, infrared observatories tracked stars orbiting Sagittarius A star at blistering speeds, faster than anything in our solar system. The only explanation that fit the data was gravity, immense, concentrated gravity. These stars were orbiting something invisible, something compact, something unimaginably massive. That something was a supermassive black hole, over four million times the mass of our sun, a singularity at the heart of our galaxy quietly shaping the motion of stars, gas, and even time itself. The final proof came through decades of measurements and simulations. In 2020, the Nobel Prize in Physics
was awarded for the discovery of Sagittarius A's true nature. And still, the map wasn't complete. With the Gaia Space Observatory launched in 2013, astronomers began collecting precise positions and motions for over a billion stars. Combined with radio and infrared data, we now have the most detailed 3D map of the Milky Way ever constructed. And in that map, we know where we are. Not at the center, not in the glow, but out here, drifting in a quieter lane of the galaxy, close enough to feel its gravity, far enough to escape its violence. It took centuries, new eyes, and new light to find our place. But we did, not by moving through the galaxy, but by learning how to see it. So now we know, we are not at the center. We never were. Our solar system drifts along the Orion arm, nestled in a minor spur between the larger spiral limbs of the galaxy, orbiting the core from a respectful distance, 26,000 light years away from the chaos at its heart. And what lies there is not peace or clarity, but a gravitational beast, Sagittarius, a star, a supermassive black hole surrounded by radiation, turbulence, and stars moving at impossible speeds. It is a place of compression, collision, and destruction, a violent engine that fuels the structure of the galaxy, but would extinguish any hope for life nearby. And so perhaps, by not being at the center, we were given a chance. The outskirts of the galaxy are quieter, less crowded, less catastrophic. Here, the stars are more scattered. The supernovae are rare. The radiation is dim, and in that dimness, life found a foothold. Complex molecules had time to form. Planets had time to cool. Consciousness had time to ask questions. For a long time, our distance from the center felt like a demotion. First Earth was not the center of the universe. Then the Sun wasn't the center of the galaxy. And now, we find ourselves in a forgotten corner of a vast spinning disk. But maybe that's not insignificance. Maybe that's shelter. Maybe the reason we're here to ponder our place in the galaxy is precisely because we weren't in its spotlight. We've found our coordinates, not through sight, but through shadows. We've mapped our home, not from above, but from within, piece by piece, variable by variable. And in doing so, we've turned darkness into understanding. So if this strange, quiet edge of the Milky Way resonates with you, if the poetry of being small and far speaks louder than being central, leave a trace. Like the globular clusters that once revealed the center, your presence here helps light the path forward. Subscribe if you haven't yet, like if it helped you see something new. And remember, sometimes the best view of the galaxy comes not from where you stand, but from how you choose to look.